And in fact, if you if you take a lot of antioxidants, like for example, vitamin C, which has a lot of antioxidation properties, you can actually prevent muscle growth after exercise, for example, because the growth is stimulated by oxidation. Hey guys, today we have a very special guest with us. She is Amber Ohan. Amber is one of the leading personalities of the meat-based diet movement and has been studying and experimenting with ketogenic diets since 1997. Being a data scientist with a background in mathematics, computer science, linguistics and psychology, Amber overcame her struggle with weight fluctuations and some psychiatric issues by applying her analytical thinking which ultimately led her to the world of meat-based diet. Her deep and meticulous research regarding ketogenic nutrition has helped thousands of people to reverse their illness directly or indirectly. I'm very, very, very happy to welcome Amber Ohan to the show. Thanks, Amber, for coming to the show. Thank you so much for having me, BNS. Oh, thanks, Amber. Amber, uh, before we go into the interview, can you share where can people connect with you? Yes, uh, I I have a website called mostlyfat.com, mostly-fat, and I also can be found on Twitter with the handle Keto Carnivore. Thank you, Amber. Amber, my first question is, many health experts advise us to follow a low-fat diet, but can humans thrive without adequate fat consumption? Well, of course they can't strive without adequate fat, but the question really is how much fat do we need for it to be adequate, right? Um, I think now that we have had access to a lot of carbohydrates from grain and other uh, sources that we didn't have as much access to in most of our evolution, we're able to get a lot of energy that we might not have been able to get before without as much fat, but that doesn't mean that eating fat is bad for us or that eating fat um, isn't necessary. So there are definitely some kinds of fat that are that are more necessary than others. But saturated fat, for example, which is the one that a lot of people are uh, speaking badly about, is it's not considered essential because our bodies can make it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't benefit us to eat more. And in fact, the more saturated fat that you eat, the less that your body has to make and the less that is in your blood. So if you're worried about saturated fat in your blood, for example, eating more doesn't necessarily raise that. Thank you, Amber. Amber, according to you, what is an ideal fat to protein ratio? Oh, that's such a tricky question. <laughs> I think, uh, well, if we're talking about uh, gram by gram, anywhere between one to one, so one fat gram per gram of protein to two to one, seems to be a very nice ideal for a lot of humans. If you are struggling with with weight or autoimmune or other kinds of conditions that you think uh, that brought you to the carnivore lifestyle, sometimes some people are finding that the higher fat closer to two to one proportion is actually better than the lower fat closer to one to one. But I've seen a lot of variety in ways that people can succeed in terms of fat to protein. It's very contentious because a lot of people are saying that the only way to lose weight is to really lower your fat and raise your protein which I think is funny because in the in the low carb world we've known for a long time that that high fat does not cause fat gain so it's funny to see this idea becoming popular again and and I will say that some people do get success by lowering fat and raising protein but a lot of people also get success by actually raising fat and and bringing protein back down to adequate levels you don't want to go too low of course but um I think there's a lot of success in in that variety between one to one and two to one is usually where people want to be. Thank you, Amber. Amber, can you please clear the confusion regarding animal-based protein and mTOR? Oh yes. So <laughs> protein 
sometimes gets a bad rap because it can raise mTOR. Why do we care about mTOR? Well, we have at some point figured out that mTOR is involved in growth, but also that inhibiting mTOR can improve longevity. So of course, everyone wants to live long and healthy. And so there, there's an idea that we need to reduce mTOR as much as possible. Well, we don't want to reduce it as much as possible because it's required for growth. You need it for brain synthesis, for muscle growth. So you don't want to put mTOR down too far. But there is a concern that if you're eating protein a lot, then you won't allow mTOR to be low enough, often enough, to uh, allow you your best health. But in the context of a carnivore diet, there's something that is uh, often not considered, which is that you are already in a ketogenic state. So when you're in a ketogenic state, actually mTOR it suppresses ketosis. So if you have high ketosis, you already know that your mTOR has to be somewhat lower. So that's, so that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect is that you are not stimulating insulin so much, and you're not probably eating as frequently as you would need to if you were on a, a more uh, carbohydrate-heavy diet. So what we what we see that I think is a very healthy pattern is that when you eat a lot of protein, yes, it may uh, increase your mTOR for a short period. And then after you eat, uh, the mTOR begins to subside again. And it's going to subside lower than it would be if you were on a carbohydrate-based diet, which it, with the insulin is going to keep your mTOR higher for a longer period. So to put that in more context, for example, uh, one of the leading experts in longevity, Walter Longo, advocates for a five-day fast periodically, maybe once a month, to maintain health through activating these longevity pathways that include inhibiting mTOR. But he's talking about a five-day fast that's necessary to get those pathways activated from the point of view of being on a carbohydrate-based diet in which you're not in ketosis. Well, it takes two to three days to get into a ketogenic state from a high-carb diet. So the benefits that he's talking about that you need, <laughs> in fact, I think he would probably say three to five days to get to, on from a carnivore diet, you, basically just overnight fasting or maybe even a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, is already going to put you in a position where your mTOR has been inhibited. So from my perspective, it seems to me that on a carnivore diet, you're hitting the, the mTOR highs that are going to be beneficial for growth, and then you're hitting those lows very quickly after in in uh, in alternation, which which means that you, you don't have to necessarily worry about uh, the effect of protein acutely on your mTOR, the way that you might if you were on a diet that's stimulating insulin all the time. Thank you, Amber, for clearly explaining us. Amber, people are crazy about the antioxidants. What happens if you take too much antioxidants uh, from outside? Antioxidants are a funny thing <laughs> because the body uses oxidation and antioxidation to to signal all kinds of cellular activities including growth and metabolism and most of that is done inside the cell so you create oxidation and then you you endogenously synthesize antioxidants on your own that are just enough to put the the oxidation in check to keep everything in balance. Now, it's true that a lot of chronic diseases are associated with too much oxidation that your body hasn't been able to keep in check. And so there's this idea that if you add antioxidants on top of that, then you can kind of help your body. But it's <laughs> it's really hard to do that correctly because you can't see inside at the cellular level exactly how much oxidation and antioxidation you need and it's all happening very quickly. And in fact, if you if you take a lot of antioxidants like for example vitamin C, which has a lot of antioxidation properties, you can actually prevent muscle growth after exercise for example because the growth is stimulated by oxidation. Another related uh, idea is that um, a lot of plant 
factors that are thought to be beneficial through antioxidation mechanisms are actually not stimulating antioxidation, or rather they are stimulating antioxidation, but the way that they're doing that is by causing damage and oxidation. So for example, uh, curcumin from turmeric, um, it, we, we know that if we isolate that and concentrate it down, and you take a lot of that, especially in not just the spice, but in the pill form where it's even further concentrated, that can have uh, an antioxidation effect in total. But it's not because it's an antioxidant, it's actually because it's an oxidant. So you're actually adding a, a stimulation of oxidation that causes your body to say, whoa, we need to make antioxidants to take care of this. And sometimes that extra stimulation can have a beneficial overall effect. But like I said earlier, it can be hard to just from the outside figure out exactly how much oxidation or antioxidation stimulation that you need. Uh, if you give too much, there have been studies where you know, there's much interest in this for cancer, for example, because adding a bit of stimulation to create these endogenous antioxidants can actually be beneficial for health. But if you give too much, it can be too much because you're just adding extra stress to the body. So I think, you know, we need to be a little bit careful about just throwing things uh, in a medicinal way without knowing what doses we need and um, assuming that it, that more is always better. Thank you, Amber. For example, like uh, even if you take the case of vitamin C, if you take too much of it, uh, it converts into oxalates, right? <laughs> so many people... Oh, yeah, that's another problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Amber. Amber, some people argue that the reason why post-agriculture human skeletal structure is weak it's due to lack of exercise, but not due to grains. What is your opinion on that? I think it could be both, although <laughs> uh, it seems to me that farming is a, actually a very labor intensive kind of activity. So I, I don't think that having farming has necessarily made us less active. I do think there is some lack of activity that's come in very recent, like in the last maybe 100 years or so, we might be a lot less active. But I don't think that that started with farming. And if you look, it's always a little bit dangerous to compare um, modern hunter-gatherer or modern um, places that are not modern, <laughs> if you'll excuse the sounding contradiction. But it, be careful to compare those people to a model of how we're imagining what people used to live like before agriculture. Uh, but nonetheless, if you look at some of these hunter-gatherer tribes, they're not working as hard as you might maybe imagine. And certainly um, energy expenditure is, is not different, which is kind of surprising. So yes, I do think exercise is going to make your skeleton stronger, but then there are other contributions. You need you need to have nutrition, proper nutrition, to be able to build a strong muscular and skeletal system. And nutrition definitely went down when we when we uh, started grain agriculture and were less dependent on, or less we had less available meat. One of the parts of the skeleton that has apparently changed is skull size. And I think it's pretty difficult to make an argument that exercise was the motivation or the, the reason that um, your skull size went down. Also, Amber, like, uh, how can they explain regarding tooth cavities? Can lack of exercise <laughs> make tooth cavities? <laughs> Good point, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Amber. Amber, can you talk about the importance of meat-based bioactives? Sure. Uh, mo most of the time when we hear the word bioactives, we are thinking of these kinds of antioxidant stimulants that I was talking about earlier, like quercetin and uh, turmeric and um, other plant-based bioactives. But there are bioactive components in meat as well. So for example, there are amino acids like taurine. A taurine is <laughs> has so many 
uh, good potential functions in the body. It's funny because for a long time it it was considered a mystery because the, we, we couldn't find anything that it actually did. But once we started doing studies on, on giving taurine to people, uh, we saw all kinds of beneficial effects, for example, in, in diabetes and, and growth. And I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, taurine is one. Um, other meat bioactives, uh, carnitine, which is important for fat metabolism. Carnitine, I think, is especially important if you're going to go on a ketogenic diet. So, of course, obviously, you can go on a ketogenic diet without any meat at all. But carnitine is something that you can only find in meat. Actually, that's not strictly true. There is some amount of carnitine in avocados, for example, but it's highest in meat and almost exclusively in meat. And carnitine is used to shuttle fat inside the mitochondria. And so when you're on a ketogenic diet, you're going to use up more carnitine than you would otherwise. So I think it's particularly important that you find a source of that when you're on a ketogenic diet. Thank you, Amber. Amber, what is the role of fruit in a meat-based diet? Can we include fruits? <laughs> Well, I mean, you can eat whatever you want, but <laughs> I wouldn't call it a carnivore diet if you were adding fruit, just simply because the carnivore diet is, it's a, it's a protocol that people developed over time uh, by, we had a community of people who were trying to eliminate plants from the diet and see what happens, and we found all kinds of benefits. And fruits were definitely not one of the things that were on this protocol. And it's not clear to me. I mean, we don't even have clinical trials already to see if the benefits that so many people are seeing from a carnivore diet are replicatable in, in a specific way by following that protocol. But if you then add other things like fruit, the guarantee that that, that will give you the same kind of benefits becomes even lower because we just don't have enough uh, people who have tried that and, and found the same benefit. Now, there may be people who feel like, well, I, I did well in a carnivore diet, and when I added fruit, I felt the same or I felt better. But there are probably also as many people who uh, tried to add fruit and are not getting the same benefits. So I think that if you want to eat an animal-based diet and add fruit, and it doesn't seem to interfere with the benefits that you've maintained, then that's that's a fine thing to do. But it's not the carnivore diet. That's just something completely different. Thank you, Amber. Amber, why RDA ranges are not accurate? <laughs> well, the RDAs were designed to try to find out how much of each of the nutrients that we have learned are essential would be needed for a person to, for like an average person to be very sure that they were getting enough. So it's not a 100% guarantee, but the way that they're designed is if, if everyone took the RDA for a particular nutrient, then almost everyone would be getting enough. So that means that <laughs> the average person is already getting more than they need, right? So, so that's what the RDAs are designed for. It's for a population. But all of the study that we've done to come up with these RDAs, and it's extensive uh, because there are so many different ones and each one has a different way of trying to figure it out. All of these were done in the context of a high carb diet. And there are many things that change when you're on a carnivore diet from a high carb diet. So there are, there are just food interactions, for example. If you're eating a lot of grains, which a high carb diet typically is, in which all these RDAs are based on a, a grain-based diet, you have um, interactions that would, for example, what, one good example for an interaction is zinc and other minerals. But we, what, we know that zinc, for example, is very much, uh, the absorption of it is very much less when you're eating phytates, uh, which are a high component of grains and legumes. So if you are looking at it, if you did a study that was looking at people who eat a lot of grains and legumes and tried to figure out how much zinc they needed, 
you're going to find that they needed a much higher amount than if you were looking at a, a population where they weren't eating grains and legumes. So many of the RDAs may be inflated by, uh, by the context that they were developed in. Uh, another problem can be just your metabolic biochemical things that are going on. So I already mentioned carnitine and I said that carnitine, well, carnitine is not considered an essential nutrient because we can create it out of vitamin C actually. <laughs> well, we need vitamin C. It's not completely made out of vitamin C, but one of the things you need for carnitine is vitamin C. And carnitine is used more in a ketogenic metabolism than you would expect it to be used in a high carbon metabolism. Um, on the other side of the uh, equation, uh, something like magnesium might be used less, for example. Um, iodine uh, is related to thyroid metabolism. And we know that on a keto in a ketogenic state, our T3 levels are less. We don't need as much T3 because we're not using as much carbohydrate. So it stands to reason that we would need less iodine. Basically, if you look at all of the RDAs, uh, we, we can't know that they will be the same on a ketogenic diet. And there are reasons to believe that some of them would be too high or and in some cases maybe too low. So I almost feel like we have to start again <laughs> with the RDAs uh, because they just, they just don't transfer. A lot of, I, I'm not going to say that we don't need the same vitamins because I think, you know, human physiology is going to be fairly stable in terms of we're still going to need things that we couldn't make in order to carry out metabolic functions. But the amounts, I think we have to start from scratch in, in a lot of those cases and, and find out what happens be, just because the interactions and the metabolic state are so different. Amber, where do you get your uh, vitamin C? <laughs> Uh, well, I get it from meat. <laughs> uh, meat does have some vitamin C. It's confusing because if you look at a lot of the databases that are online, they say that meat has no vitamin C. But when I, I looked into this because, well, <laughs> because there's evidence that uh, people were not getting scurvy, which is what you would, would normally happen if you weren't eating vitamin C. Um, and so I found out that in the databases, they, they didn't measure for some reason in, in meat. So if you look up, it'll say like for a piece of steak, it'll say there's zero vitamin C in it. That's not really true. There is some vitamin C in it and vitamin C is heat sensitive, but even if you cook it up to medium, possibly even more, you should still be able to get vitamin C, but it's not very much. Um, it seems to be enough. And if you look at people like me who've been eating a carnivore diet for a very long time, we don't seem to have any signs of lack of vitamin C. But if you're, if you're concerned about getting vitamin C, you could do something like add a little bit of lemon juice or even take a supplement. And I don't think that that would hurt you. Although we did talk about being careful about, not, about taking too much. So, you know, you got to, strike a kind of balance for what makes you feel comfortable in terms of risk. But it's it's not true that meat has no vitamin C. And if you look up other databases, or if you look at, for example, other kinds of meat, like if you look at salmon, for example, in the USDA database, it'll tell you that there's vitamin C in it because they bothered to measure it. So it's a very confusing thing. The other the other component that I think is interesting about vitamin C is I mentioned that vitamin C is necessary for the creation of carnitine. And I think if you're eating a lot of meat, the carnitine itself is probably sparing the use of vitamin C. There are other things that might spare it too, like uric acid, which might go up, uh, well, does go up at least initially on a ketogenic diet, which takes over some of the antioxidant functions that vitamin C might also be responsible for. Thank you, Amber. Can we mix carbs with meat? If yes, how much? Well, again, it wouldn't be a carnivore diet unless those carbs are coming from uh, 
something that's an animal sourced food because the, the spirit of the carnivore diet is is really about animal sourced food so for example milk would be fairly high in carbs liver has some carbohydrate eggs have some carbohydrate um, but most people who are on a carnivore diet are doing it for uh, weight or diabetes or something like this where carbohydrate tolerance itself would be low. So you could do a kind of mixture of, I'm going to eat carnivore foods, that on, but only those ones that are also low in carbohydrate. But I think it's interesting because when I first came to the carnivore diet, I assumed that that the low carb part of it was was important, and it might not be as important as the elimination of plant toxic um, components, at least for some people. So there are people who definitely still need a, a low carbohydrate to reach their health goals, but I don't think that that's true of everyone. Thank you, Amber. Amber, people get uh, concerned about their gut microbiome if we suggest a meat-based diet. Is meat-based diet gut healthy? I don't think that we can tell that a meat-based diet would not be gut healthy um, for various reasons. Uh, one reason you could think about is the, the various animals on earth that are carnivorous animals and uh, they all have healthy functioning guts and there's no reason to think that not eating vegetables is somehow harming their health. Um, another perspective is that a lot of the, well, gut bacteria adapts very quickly to what you're eating. And basically, if if you have a kind of gut bacteria that is, uh, that really thrives on eating, say, the kinds of components that are in broccoli, and then you don't eat broccoli, well, then those gut bacteria are going to go down, but maybe you don't need them because you're not <laughs> you're not eating it. If you see what I mean. So, for, uh, you know, if if the the benefit of having those bacteria is to help you digest components of the vegetables that were in your diet, and then you don't have the veg those vegetables, then there's no real reason to think that you need to have those bacteria if those foods aren't coming into your your gut anymore. You know, there's something that's common to the discussion about RDAs where because the study of what a healthy gut biome looks like has been done on a population that eats a high carb, high grain and moderate vegetable intake diet, we've we've started doing things like mapping out what kinds of strains would be characteristic of a person who ha it, who is healthy or is unhealthy or maybe is susceptible to this disease or that disease but when you <laughs> when you look at that you already have the base assumption of what they're eating so let's make a comparison if you take someone's blood labs and you say oh my goodness they have very high ketones they and you they're on a high carb diet that would be contextually inappropriate right you would say oh they must have uh they must be experiencing ketoacidosis they're diabetic this is very this is a marker of very dangerous health situation but if you have a low carb diet person and you look at them and you see ketones in their blood, you're not going to worry about that, right? So the same thing can be true if you're looking at the gut biome. If you have certain strains that may be a problem when you when that person is eating a certain food, it's an inappropriate response to that food. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's an inappropriate response to a low carb diet. So uh, again, I think we we're in a place where we have to be very cautious about transferring knowledge from one context to another and assuming that it means one thing um, means the same thing in both contexts when it's very likely that it doesn't, especially because gut bacteria changes so rapidly in response to different foods. Thank you, Amber. Amber, how can a layman know what is the right dietary advice? <laughs> oh, 
I don't know that they can. <laughs> um, you have to either, well, usually it's a combination, but you have to either decide you're going to trust somebody to do that research and make those um, decisions for you, or you're going to have to learn how to read some of the literature and make some of those decisions for yourself. Well, I guess the third possibility is that you can do a lot of uh, looking at what happens to you and to people that you see when they eat different diets and look at their health and, and make decisions that way. Um, it's considered not very scientific, uh, but it's a little bit ironic because we don't want science to tell us to not pay attention to the experience of our own of our own bodies, right? Like if if science told you that there's nothing wrong with something that you happen to be allergic to, and we didn't know that there could be such an allergy and you ate it, uh, you wouldn't, if, and you had a bad reaction, you wouldn't keep doing it just because you couldn't find a paper that told you that it was bad, right? <laughs> so I guess those are the, those. It's a three pronged approach. You you find people that you trust. Um, and you can do that through um, looking at what they've said and trying to reason out whether they're being logical or whether they're getting the results that you think are correct. You can learn how to dissect the literature yourself, which may seem very intimidating, or maybe you don't have time for it. Like there are all kinds of things that I don't have the time to become an expert on, and I just have to decide that some people in my life are going to, I'm going to trust what they say about it. And you can try things out for yourself. And I think all three of those are valid methods. Actually, Amber, like people can be easily misled. For example, uh, when like some of my subscribers uh, followed a carnivore diet, they have sent me a blood report of uh, like blood work of past uh, year and now. And what happened is that uh, everything that was red became green now after a year. But they were so concerned about cholesterol. <laughs> And when they yes. went to doctor, they said that don't follow this because it's very dangerous. But I'm asking, you reverse like 20 symptoms or something and you're concerned about is like carb, um, the cholesterol. So people are easily misled. So that's one concern. I agree. And it, it's, it's complex because um, when... <laughs> When the dietary recommendations say one thing, and when somebody that you trust says another thing, then you're you're in this dilemma, and you don't know who to believe. And there's not really there's not really a good answer for that. The cholesterol thing in particular, I think that we don't really we don't really know. I personally don't think that LDL cholesterol is causative in heart disease, which is the big concern, right? And I don't think that any of the data that we have definitively shows that. But there are a lot of people who are smart people who, even sometimes people who are low-carb advocates, who think that LDL might be dangerous. And we just don't have the studies to, to definitively show it. And the problem with something like heart disease is you're looking at like way into the future, a risk factor for something, right? So <laughs> you've got this dilemma, all of these things that were dragging me down and making me feel bad and were giving me a, a problem right in the present, those things have been cleared up, but now I'm worried about something that might be a problem in the future. And all I can really say to that is, for most things in life, if, you, <laughs> if you're having a health improvement, now that almost always is going to translate into a, a health improvement later. It, it just doesn't make sense to me to say, yes, you, you are fitter, you are much more full of energy, you feel better in all these ways. The, these particular symptoms that were causing you problems have all gone away, but we've got this one, you know, suspicion that in your blood, some measurement that might correspond in a correlation way to to some bad outcome in the future. 
it's to my mind the the choice there is completely obvious like you can't I, like for me personally my my story is not only a weight story but bipolar depression that was the thing that carnivore cured for me or put into remission there's no way i'm going to go back to a diet that makes me sicker in all these ways just because of some one particular uh, one particular risk factor for something that might happen in the future Yes, Amber. Amber, just I want to share one more thing because uh, I know it's funny, but we should not laugh. So a person uh, sent me a mail and uh, he had triglycerides of 900. And after doing the diet, it came to 120. And wow. still he was concerned about LDL, a little bit of rise of LDL. So like I am mm-hmm. doing my best to educate people, but uh, they are being easily misled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. And but now we have questions from subscribers. Okay. okay. Uh, actually my friend Andy Mant of Blue Blocks had a DNA test and told he had APOE4 gene. The advice he he had uh, got is that uh, he should not eat any saturated fat. Is that good advice for him and what should he eat instead of saturated fat if he's following a carnivore or keto diet? Okay, so what I understand about that advice is that it comes from looking at LDL, actually. (laughs) So it's very much tied into the conversation we just had. So saturated fat seems to increase LDL more in people with APOE4 than in other people. And then there's a presumption that that high LDL is going to lead to heart disease outcomes. I don't think that we that that's that that's an established um, link. And so I would say that he should only follow that advice. He or she should only follow that advice if they are if they think that LDL causes heart disease. The other uh, component that you might take into account is that it seems like, uh, well, APOE4 is apparently the older variant of that, uh, of APOE. And so there's at least some kind of reasoning that you could apply that uh, the APOE4 is the uh, variant that would be more associated with uh, the diet (laughs) that is less modern and and therefore um, more meat and fat heavy. So I, I know of a lot of people who are APOE4 and some of them do follow this uh, advice to eat less saturated fat. And so if you're going to do that and if you're on a carnivore diet, that means, well, you're gonna have to eat more, I guess more fish or try to, um, I don't know, uh, you're going to have to avoid dairy almost certainly uh, because dairy is a very high saturated fat diet or a uh, source. But a lot of people that I know who have APOE4, one or two copies of that, uh, don't subscribe to that idea that saturated fat would be worse for them. And in fact, they think that it might actually be, they might be better suited to a diet with high saturated fat and high animal foods. It, but they just accept the the risk of having the higher LDL. Thank you, Amber. Amber, Heather Gorby has a question. What is an ideal protein to fat ratio and fasting regimen for perimenopause uh, women? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> some people have said that menopause might require or make a higher protein and lower fat regimen more appropriate, but I don't think we have enough evidence uh, to say something like that. I I have seen people both postmenopausal and premenopausal who are thriving better with higher fat than higher protein. I think I think the only answer at this point is to try both and see which works better for you personally because we don't 
seem to have enough information on why one works better for some people than others, at least in terms of weight control. Thank you, Amber. Amber, uh, we have another question. Can, can a meat-based diet help with bipolar and depression? In my experience, yes, it can very much. Um, it, you know, I, I was on a low-carb diet since 1997, and that gave me a lot of health benefits. But my depression continued to worsen over the course of over a decade while I was on a low-carb diet. And it wasn't until I removed plants that my bipolar disorder went into complete remission. I mean, I've been off all meds for over 10 years. I have not had a relapse in that way. That doesn't mean I don't have moods, but I don't have the kind of symptoms of depression and suicidality that I used to have just basically constantly. Uh, well, I wouldn't I wasn't constantly suicidal, but I would have those symptoms and and other kinds of mood fluctuations on a very regular basis. So we don't yet have a study showing how many people that would work for. I know it's not just me and I definitely think it's worth trying because there are the the only other solutions that we have at this point are medications that come with side effects and that don't always work. Yes, Amber. Recently, I interviewed Michaela Peterson, so <laughs> she has the same point. Yeah. Um, Amber, can we get all the vitamins and nutrients from a meat-based diet? It seems so, yes. Um, especially if you're going to include organs. Um, <laughs> when you talk about the question of can we get all of those nutrients, it's, you have this baseline assumption of wh- what you think that amount of all those nutrients are. And as we already discussed, maybe some of those um, established nutrient levels may not apply on a carnivore diet once you are regularly ketogenic and you've removed certain interfering factors. However, um, we have examples of societies, for example, the Inuit or the Maasai, or the Mongolians or certain Plains Indians in uh, North America who were on a meat-based diet and thrived just fine. So that's one one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is just um, going through the list of RDAs and seeing that you can actually get all of those things from animal, uh, some animal source. The um, one one that is a little bit more difficult if you're not eating dairy might be calcium and i don't know if calcium needs are changing depending on the carnivore diet it it could be but if you are not eating any dairy calcium might be a source of concern thank you amber amber last three questions a subscriber is writing that uh, our ancestors did not had access to eat meat three times per day then is it healthy to eat meat three times per day if we are hungry or is there something called too much eating of meat okay so let's strip that back into t- there's several components our ancestors did not have the ability to eat meat three times a day i'm not sure that we know that that's true um we talk about famines being common but i i think that that might actually be a myth. We know that famines were common once agriculture came into play because when you have grain agriculture or other agriculture as the basis of your diet, then something like a drought can wipe out your stores um, and then and then you're faced with a famine situation. Whereas if you're hunting, yes, you can have times where the hunt wasn't good, but we also would store meat, uh, dry it or ferment it for for to to be able to use it for a long time so it's not entirely clear to me that people didn't have the ability to eat three times a day if they wanted to um if you're actually hungry and you have the ability to eat cuz you have access then it's not also not clear to me that that would be unhealthy we definitely benefit from having periods in which we don't eat it's normal to have <laughs> you know a meal and then um let your 
let your metabolism carry through and and then have a period where you're living off of your body stores. But if you're actually hungry, I think that that is a signal that has a reason behind it and we need to pay attention to. If you're hungry three times a day, I think that's a little bit uncommon. Most people that I talk to who are on carnivore eat twice a day, but I know some people who eat three times a day. And if you're getting that signal for hunger, then either you're not eating enough at your meals or you just need a little bit more. Like some people have more propensity to have blood sugar fluctuations. And if eating more times per day is helping keep your blood sugar steady, then I think that that's probably fine. But I would say that if you are not getting satiety from your meals, then maybe you're not eating enough or you're not eating enough fat uh, to feel that steady energy to last more hours throughout the day. So I guess what I'm saying is it's not necessarily bad, but if, you, um, if you're worried about being hungry all the time, maybe you should try um, eating, eating more and making sure that you're getting enough and enough fat. Thank you, Amber. And another question is, weight loss experts say that it is impossible to lose weight without calorie restriction and exercise. But I'm losing weight despite eating lots of calories on a meat-based diet. Can you explain the mechanism behind that? Yeah, there, there's a confusion between um, calorie restriction, which is definitely not necessary for weight loss, and a calorie deficit, which is definitely necessary for weight loss. It's it's like tautological. So you can't you can't lose weight without your the calories that you're expending being more than the calories that you're taking in, right? But that doesn't mean <laughs> that in order to get that difference between what you're expending and what you're taking in has to be something that you've voluntarily done, right? So if you if you're eating more but the food that you're eating is hormonally or through biochemical signals allowing you to get more energy access to what you already have, you might actually start um, spontaneously expending more energy, not because you're trying to work out, not because you're eating less, but because the hormonal system in your body changed to allow you to use the energy that you have. So I experienced this early on in carnivore. I can remember, you know, I'm not against exercise per se. I like being active and doing things, but I never liked running. And I have this vivid memory of close to when I started carnivore and I was walking my children to school on a regular basis. And that walk just became more and more fun and enjoyable. I would literally be skipping down the road. And at one point, I remember feeling so much energy that I broke into a run for no reason. And it's, it's <laughs> it, it it just was very clear to me that the, even though I was eating more and I was eating a lot at that time, when I was losing weight intensely, I was also eating over 2,500 calories a day on average. And yet the energy that I had access to was more than it was before. And I think that's what accounts for the difference. So you don't, need to restrict calories to have a caloric deficit. Thank you, Amber. Amber, last question. Would you like to issue a seven-day challenge to our subscribers? Would I like to issue a seven-day challenge? <laughs> okay. Um, if you are already on a carnivore diet, then I would challenge you to Try eating just to hunger, uh, by which I mean <laughs> don't restrict your eating to uh, try to um, only eat as much as you're hungry for. That's not what I mean at all. What I mean is the opposite. Eat as much as you want without feeling any kind of guilt or worry that um, you're somehow uh, eating too much for your body to handle. Because... What, what I think often happens is the opposite. The more food that your body senses is available, the more energy 
and energetic things that you your body will take on to do so some people might um, not really get the full healing that they could experience because they're not eating enough and their body senses and energy deficits so eat and eat enough and eat a eat enough fat and and try not to worry about it and and try not to put um, all these constraints on what you're doing think and free yourself to think about other things that you enjoy in your life other than the number of calories or how much food you're eating thank you amber amber thank you so much for coming to the show and uh, helping us to become healthy thank you thank you so much you're very welcome it was a pleasure thank you subscribe to bns goku great